Welcome to the um, Center for Heritage second webinar on the preservation of underwater heritage. Is it better preserved in a museum, a laboratory, or in situ? Challenge and perspective. This is what we're going to talk about. So before I give the floor to our fantastic speakers, and I thank them very much for being here with us today, I'm going to shortly speak about what is underwater cultural heritage. What are we talking about today? Um, Underwater heritage is actually very broadly defined or can be broadly defined in order to include ships, buildings, artifacts, submerged cities, cave dwellings, anything, almost anything that has been underwater. And according to the 2001 UNESCO Convention on the Protection of the Underwater Cultural Heritage, it has to be submerged for at least 100 years. So this is the cut of date for the um, UNESCO Convention. but it might be that uh, we consider underwater heritage something that has been found or has been sunk more than or less, sorry, than 100 years ago. Why does it need protected, protecting? Why is it important to protect this? First, because it is true, we, we could say that um, um, the use of uh, underwater resources and shipwrecks have, have been used for, for many years, have been used in the mid, it was used in the Middle Ages, it was, it has always happened. But what has changed? What has changed is the, um, the use of uh, scuba diving, the use of improved technology that allow us to go further, deeper in the seabed, seabed and to bring things up. Uh, bigger things up, as we will be told about the Mary Rose ship, for example, bring up a whole ship. So these these um, um, technologies were not available 100 years ago or 200 years ago, and it also it also this technology also allow more treasure hunters to go uh, and to to. Uh, to, 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 sorry, <laughs> to extract um, all these um, uh, golden bullions, all these uh, jewels, rare coins, porcelains, or even lead that can be sold. So um, a lot of um, things that can be valuable for archaeological heritage and that are not available anymore. So we're going to talk about the, the fishing industries, the sponge harvesting, all those industries and development that can be damaging to the underwater heritage. Uh, cable laying cables or wind farms here in Kent is very important or on other developments which uh, Fiona is going to talk about. So first we're going to have um, Professor um, Eleanor Schofield, who is going to talk to us about um, arts when arts meet science and keeping the Mary Rose ship shape. So, um, sorry. Eleanor Schofield uh, did her PhD in material science at Imperial College London in 2006. Uh, she completed several posts and research posts in, in Stanford, sorry, Stanford, and is also a member of the Center for Heritage of the University of Kent. So she's the um, director of, sorry, the head of conservation and collections at the Mary Rose Trust. Thank you, um, Eleanor, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thanks for the introduction and inviting me to speak. Right, I'm just going to share my screen. Let's hope that this works. Where is the... Okay, can you all see the screen okay? Perfect, right. Um, yeah, good evening everybody. Um, as Sophie said, my name is Eleanor Schofield and I work at the Mary Rose Trust. Um, my background is actually in material science and engineering. Um, I started off not really doing anything to do with heritage and it was through um, ways of looking at underst and understanding materials that I ended up um, working where I am now. Um, a little bit of background to the Mero, some of you may be familiar with it, but those of you who aren't, this was a ship of Henry VIII, which he commissioned when he first came to the throne in 1509. And then she first set sail in 1511. She had a very long career. It's a very common misconception that she sank on her maiden voyage. She did not. Uh, so she sailed for 34 years, was involved in, in various battles, um, but then came to a very, very sudden end um, in 1545 on the 19th of July. She was going out to confront an invading French fleet. And there's a combination of factors that probably contributed to her sinking, but it was a huge, huge tragedy. 
over 500 people went down with a ship and there were very few survivors. Uh, there was obviously lots of people there who saw it. Henry VIII himself was there and he saw it. There were some initial attempts to try and get some of the items from the ship, particularly things like the expensive cannons uh, with very limited success. The site was then left pretty much untouched until the 1800s when the Dean brothers, who were pioneers of, of diving equipment, went down there and were able to reach the wreck and take some things from it. Obviously, at that point in time, there was no such thing as protected sites. It was a fair game. So they would go and take stuff and then sell it. So there is actually, a, there are a few bits of, of the Mario's collection which aren't within the Mario's Trust because they were raised at this time. Sometimes they do end up weaving their way back to us at some point, but um, yeah, it's just a kind of interesting side that at that point um, you could do what you want there. And then in the 1960s, uh, somebody called Alexander McKee set out with a dream to try and find the Mary Rose. They, they scanned the seabed using various techniques and eventually found an anomaly near where the old maps said the, the ship had gone down. Uh, they then did excavations, eventually discovered that it was the Mary Rose and started to raise artifacts. Um, this went on between 1971 to 1982. There were lots of ex excavations. Until 1979, this was all volunteer-led. The, the Mary Rose Trust, the charity that is now, didn't form until 1979. So all of this was people just following their, their passion, their determination to try and raise this um, shipwreck and all the artifacts to be able to tell the story. Uh, this slide here shows you some of the conditions with of the diving. I'm told by some of the divers that these photos were taken on a good day. Uh, typically, it's not. There's not a lot of visibility there at all. Um, but I mean, they're just incredible images. They give you a sense of the scale of what they achieved back then, what they were working with, and and how they were the conditions in which they were having to handle the object objects whilst looking after themselves, the people they were working with. You know, all the safety. It really was a, a huge um, endeavor and a massive achievement for them all. And then some of you will remember this image. So this was in 1982. This was the raising of the ship. She came into Portsmouth Historic Dockyard and has been in dry dock number three in Portsmouth Historic Dockyard ever since, although the configuration around it has slightly changed. And um, there, there was a building put around her, which was seen as a temporary building. We removed the last bit of that in around 2016, so it ended up being not quite so temporary. Um, and now since 2013, we have a, a, a museum where we're able to show the ship and the artifacts together to really tell the full story of the ship and more importantly, of the people who served on board. Now, alongside the, the ship itself, we raised over 19,000 objects. Now we have a huge range in our collection, both in terms of the materials, so inorganic, organic, so you've got metals, um, bone, leather, wood, um, yeah, all different types of metals too, but really also varying in, in what they were the purpose of the object. So there was, you know, um, things that you would associate with, you know, weapons and war, the cannons, things like that. There was also very personal objects. So shoes and combs, rosary beads, we even found some little dice, um, a backgammon board. Um, we do have some of the human remains as well. We also found the ship's dog, who you can see here. So for a material scientist, this obviously presents a very interesting challenge of how to look after these things um, with the aim of simultaneously telling the story of them now to in as many different ways and to as many different people as possible, but also making sure that they last for as long as possible, which is a, a kind of continual balancing act. So I was just going to briefly tell you about a couple of the materials um, that we've done quite a lot of work on. The first of which is the wood. We obviously have a lot of wood in our collection. The ship's behind me, as you can see, um, but also lots and lots of uh, tankards, barrels, bowls, spoons, just yeah, lots and lots of wood. And this, what I'm showing here is a cross section of the mirrors wood, just to give you an idea of what it looks like. And then on the right hand side is both a light microscope and an electron microscope image. And what I'm really wanting to show you here is how, what the wood looks like when it's degraded. So in the interior, even visually you can see it, it looks like wood. And the, the images where the cells are quite full, that's what you would expect. A piece of fresh wood, if I chopped it down now, a tree, took some wood, looked at it, that's what it would look like. Now, what you see on the outer surface is that it's got really dark and that's because it's degraded. 
And what's happened is some of that material has been eaten away. And the challenge with marine archaeological wood is when it's in the water, the void that's made by that degradation is, is, is full. So the water's there. However, if you take that out and then get rid of the water, it can very easily shrink and crack and dry um, too quickly and cause irreparable damage. So what we have to do is treat it in a way that when it does dry, it is stable. Um, in the case of Mary Rose, we've done that by impregnating it with a, a, a substance, a polymer, which goes in there, displaces some of the water. And so then when we dry the ship, um, there's some stability there and it doesn't all crink. Uh, crack and shrink. <laughs> um, but then there's lots of ways that we have to, to then look at the wood. Um, I've picked out here two ways. One is a kind of mechanical way, a physical way, um, and that's in movement of the ship. We've had full laser scans done of the ship at various points in time. This is a cross section of one of those scans. So I've, I've put down there the different um, stages in the conservation. The PEG is the polyethylene glycol that we sprayed the ship with. 200 and 2000 are different types of PEG. Um, and then you see the different stages of drying. And so you start to see little patterns in the wood of, of the top part that's started to come down a bit. That's, I'm afraid with that, gravity is not on our side. Um, but then you can really go onto individual elements. So on the right-hand side, I've picked out looking straight onto the ship. If you're looking at a deck beam, you see that it's quite square and straight. And then as it starts to dry, it's tilted a bit. There's a deformation at the top and that's actually because a crack is forming. So we can use these techniques to try and understand a lot more of what's happening. So that's on the movement side. On the chemical side, the entire collection suffers sometimes because of things that are in it that shouldn't be there. Because essentially the whole collection has been marinating in seawater for 500 years. So there's all kinds of things from the seawater that's in there that shouldn't be there. And over time, and especially when it dries, these can do weird and wonderful things and sometimes damaging things. What I've shown here is a, a chest panel and also a, where an iron bolt used to be. And these are these kind of salts that form, which can be very acidic and can damage the wood. I'm just going to sneak in a little bit of data here, because this is one of my favorite bits. Um, so here I'm showing a, a core sample of wood from the ship. It's just to kind of highlight how powerful some of the um, analytical techniques are that we use. What we do in the in the middle graph, what's that sh what that's showing is specifically what is there. So you can see sulfur and iron and zinc, and you can see the concentration. And what's really interesting here is you see that where it's darker, that's where you have more sulfur, iron and zinc. Now the technique below, what that does is tell you where the wood is degraded. And again, where it's highest is where it's more degraded. So you start to see these patterns that where there's dark, a dark feature, where there's lots of sulfur and iron and zinc, there's degradation. And we use all of this to, to piece together how we can um, look after it, whether it's to do a treatment or to change the conditions around it. And I'll just quickly show you a, a, another material. Um, so we have lots of iron in our collection. We have over 1,200 iron balls, iron cannonballs. Um, they, they suffer again from something getting into it from the seawater, from chlorine, from salt in seawater gets into it. And then once it's dry and on display, the moisture, the air, the chlorine together can form corrosion, which basically just busts the, the cannonball apart, as you can see there. Now, we've done some experiments where we've actually taken samples from here. So it's quite a difficult decision because it's obviously destructively testing it. However, we weighed everything up, looked at what the information was we could get from doing this on a small percentage of our collection and, and were able to justify doing it in terms of the wealth of knowledge that we would create, not just for our collection, but for other people as well. And just one last thing to show you the, the kinds of things we can then do. I've put a video in here, which I hope now is going to work. So this is then a, um, a, an, an X-ray image of a tiny piece of corrosion product. It's about this big, so a couple of centimeters across from the surface inside. And what you see is actually the dark bits of the corrosion. So interestingly with this, the, at the surface, there's not that much corrosion, but as you get further into it, there is more and you can see all the different cracks and things like that. And from this, we can start to do all kinds of um, analysis, looking at where the corrosion is, where the metal is, where the cracks are, whether they correlate in any way. And again, all of this is information which we use to then um, help inform our future conservation strategies. So I've mentioned there just a, just a couple of materials. There's, there's obviously a, a huge range of other ones that, that we work on too, which um, keeps me busy. Um, I hope that's given you a little insight into what we do. Um, there's lots and lots of people that have, have worked on that. 
Um, and then I, in any talk, I have to encourage you to come and visit us. We are open. <laughs> um, and also that you can follow us um, on social media, things like that. Look out for things that we're doing. We try to get some of the science and engineering content on there too. So thank you very much. Thank you for this very interesting presentation. I mean, I have no idea what science does, but you could make it so interesting and so approachable. Thank you. I think it's also very interesting and something we could talk about later about uh, all these um, these uh, treasure hunters who can go and, and destroy uh, those those. Uh, um, archaeological sites because you mentioned several times that it's those sites are very fragile and the artifacts are very fragile so how they can can they be preserved as well once they're taken out of the water so that's something we could probably come back later during the questions thank you um our next speaker is also going to talk about the sciences of um preserving heritage materials, so heritage materials that were underwater. So uh, Dr. Donna Arnold, who is also at the University of Kent and who is also a co-director of the Center for Heritage, um, has joined the University of Kent in 2010 and she's a senior lecturer in chemistry and forensic science. Um, so she, her background is on chemistry and so she can focus on um, materials um, and understanding how structure informs function in novel materials and also obviously in older materials as the one that are found on the Mary Rose. So Donna, thank you. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Sophie. Let me just share my screen. So hopefully you can see my presentation uh, now. Um, so for the opportunity to tell you a little bit, I'm going to very much follow on from uh, some of the work that Ellie has told you. Um, I became involved in heritage work because of Ellie. Um, she, we started working together recently. Um, and I'm going to try and talk a little bit about things more general. Um, how the science lab with some some more data that we've been collecting from the Mary Rose. Donna? Yeah? Sorry to interrupt you, but I think it's showing it on um, Is uh, it on? The presenter mode, yeah. So we can see the next slide coming up and things like that. There That's you go. Right now. That's perfect. Sometimes, sometimes it's right, sometimes it's not. I don't know how that happens. Um, <laughs> okay, so, um, so first of all, like I wanted to give a bit about heritage in the science lab, and this is very much based on a typical science lab that you might find at a university. So the instrumentation that we have available for us at, say, Kent. Um, they can provide useful information about identification. It may be that we can get information about what an artifact was or how it was used from what it's made of. Um, as Ellie is, as, indicated, we can start to think about how we perhaps develop techniques to preserve things. So if we can understand what's going on, we can work out the best way to preserve them. We can start to look at things like age. Um, so for example, we know that pigments, paints were made from certain materials in certain time frames. So this would mean that we can maybe age an object. We can start to look in authenticity and this sort of feeds into to my other interest in forensic science. We can tell by what was used or how things were used, whether or not it's authentic from the period it pertains to come from. And of course, that's important. Uh, many people have, have raised um, or brought to fake um, artifacts from shipwrecks, suggesting that they might know where the shipwreck is, but in real terms, it, it is not quite, quite the truth. We can also look at provenance. So we can start to understand where things have come from. Different regions have used different ways to manufacture things or to, to make things in history. And we can start to understand the origins of these materials by how they were made and what was in them. Within this sense, um, we can start to think about the analysis techniques that we can do. And these are important tools because they allow us to probe multiple facets of a material. And we can start to get information about the physical materials are present. So what is something made of? What, what chemicals are in there? What elements are in there? So we could, for example, I've shown a patent here, not so much underwater, but I wanted to have something that I could talk around. 
we could start to tell what physical pigments were used to make the colors in the dye, for example, or from this, then we can start to get different information. We can start to get information about the morphology of materials. And what we mean by this is the shape. So in the context of paint, this is perhaps less important. But when we start talking about things that might destroy stuff, so like Ellie was saying about bits and pieces in the ship, and I'll show some examples a bit later, how these impurities grow gives us information of the damage that they might cause. So the morphology. We can start to understand the chemistry which is happening and how this may affect the artifact. So we can start to look at how, how things are reacting with each other and what type of environment do we need to store things in. For example, a humid environment might be bad for the artifact because the, the humid air will react with something in, in, the, in the materials of the sample and degrade, degrade the sample. We can also understand what the changes which may have occurred over time. So we can start to look, and Ellie showed those really nice cores where you can start to see the, the distance that these, these degradations go in. And perhaps we can start to understand how this affects with time. There are, however, some considerations um, with these things. We have to think about um, what it is we're going to do. And Ellie, Ellie said, you know, breaking up the cannonballs to analyze them is a big deal. We have to consider how we're handling these heritage materials within a science lab. So obviously we don't want to cause more damage or new damage to, to the samples. This is, this is important. We have to consider the size. For example, this is an SEM. This image is actually of an SEM at um, Washington University um, in the States, um, but it's similar to one of the SEMs we have. I didn't have a picture of our own SEM. Um, I've not been in the office today. Uh, but what you can see is that this part here with the door open, this is where we've got to put our sample in. So we can't put big samples in because we just physically don't have the analysis space. But there are instruments that we can buy that will allow us to, to put it in so that we can, can do bigger items. So it very much is dependent on making sure that the instrumentation is capable of doing not only the analysis that we want to perform, but also capable of hosting the, the artifact that we want to analyze. Um, we have to consider the effect on the artifact. So obviously, we're here, we're hitting the artifact with an electron beam. But what damage might be caused by actually trying to visualize what's going on or trying to explore the chemistry of our artifact? Ultimately, can we sacrifice any of the material? And if not, then we need to think of ways that we can get the information we need without degrading the sample any further. And we also need to think about storage. Most labs are not set up to be um, to look after the heritage artifacts that we're trying to analyze. They're set up to, for the best instrument, to protect the instrumentation, for example, or, or to ensure that we have a safe working environment for the chemistry that we're doing. So we also need to consider within that, how do we protect the materials that we've been charged to look after whilst we perform the analysis? And how do we ensure their safety and security within the confines of a laboratory? Over the next few slides, I just wanted to look at some of the, the techniques that we can use in the science lab. And I apologize, I'm, I'm a scientist right to the core. Um, but hopefully we can start to see some of those things that I said we can look at and we can start to see how, how we, we can look at these things. <clears throat> so electron microscopy allows us to look at very small things. So it allows us to get in close and see what's happening. And Ellie showed those beautiful pictures of the wood and we could see the wood cells. And this is some work by um, Rika et al that was published this year, in fact. And this is some stone materials. And this is actually underwater heritage. This is materials that were raised. They're not very clear on where they're from, um, but you can start to see the different things. And what they found was different types of morphology. So different shapes, so we can see here, we can start to see that we've got some uh, filament types and um, versus some porous types here. And they could start to see the degradation. And they also found skeletal matter from crustaceans 
and from sea life that had had lived on the artifact and had died on the artifact as well. Some of the work that we've been doing with Ellie, and thank you, Ellie, these pictures actually come from Ellie, um, was looking at some of the bricks on the Mary Rose. So they were, these were in the galley of the ship um, and they formed the cooking in the ship. My first question when she approached and said, should we look at some bricks? I was like, there were bricks on a wooden ship. Um, it seemed alien to me, but once you start to think about these things, you can see where they come in. And what some imaging found was that there's these salts are growing on the bricks or appear to grow in the cracks on the bricks. And some SEM imaging allowed Ellie to look at how these things went together. Um, so you can start to understand how, how these salts crystallize, so how they form and they grow and what could happen once they form and they grow. And this is an SEM image of the salts taken from a brick. And you can see that they grow, some of it grows in these great big platelets, while some of it grows kind of clumpy. And when we looked a bit closer, what you can see here is you can actually get elemental information about um, what elements are present. So we can start to understand what, what it is that's happening. And you can see the yellow is sulfur. So pretty much the whole, the whole thing has got sulfur in. But then when we looked at the calcium and iron, which are shown in the orange and the purple, you can see that it's the calcium sulfate or calcium that is forming these great big platelets and iron is forming these more clumpy things. But as these platelets grow, they're pushing the bricks apart and they can damage the bricks. We need to know more information, however. It's, this is great information, but calcium and sulfur can combine in many different ways to form many different forms of, of material. Of, of compounds and how those compounds behave and how they react to things like acidic, acidic environments, moisture rich environments can be different. So it's important that we understand the phases that are present. And we can do something called X-ray diffraction to look at that. And what X-ray diffraction starts to tell us, it's like a fingerprint. It tells us where those atoms are in space within the material. And from that, we can start to tell the difference between whether or not it's iron sulfate, calcium sulfate, but the structure, the actual structure of these things. And on this slide, I've just got a X-ray diffraction pattern, and this is on some of the brick samples from the Mary Rose. And what we can see here is that these samples are all very similar, but at the same time, they're all a little bit different. And that's telling us that the, they have slightly different materials present and in slightly different contents. And Understanding how these phases relate to each other and how much of each phase we have will start to tell us, A, which phase is the more aggressive and how quickly does it grow, but B, potentially if we can develop treatment so that we can remove these, we can look at how well we've removed them. This picture on the right hand side just shows the search match. So what we've looked at is where these peaks occur and what they could be. And we can see that we have silica, which is from the bricks themselves. And then just like the SEM, we now have these iron and sulfur, iron sulfur containing and calcium sulfur containing phases. But we're able to put a bit more information on that. And that now means that we can start to understand the chemistry of these phases. We haven't done any Raman spectroscopy yet on rows, but I wanted to show Raman spectroscopy is a good technique. It's come a long way. It uses lasers to start looking at the vibrational information of a, of a compound, but it also gives you information that can be related to the structure and we can start to get a fingerprint region. And I wanted to show a little bit about my other passion in forensics. It's used for forgery detection. So we can see the top spectrum is of diamond. So we can see that we have a nice, beautiful diamond ring because the peaks are where we would expect them to be. And the spectrum below is a spectrum of made from glass. So you can see that actually, if I had just a cubic zirconia or glass ring, I would get a very different spectrum from that. The power of Raman is that actually we can use very small instruments now that are portable. So we can actually, we don't need the, the the artifact to come to the science lab, we can take the instrument to the artifact. And this is, we actually have one of these in our labs, the little Raman spectroscopy here, it's a, a mirror three. And this thing is about 
the size, I'd say a, a thick cassette, but cassettes are old now, probably not much bigger than a packet of cigarettes or, you know, but this sort of size, it fits in the palm of your hand and you can take this to, to the artifact, which allows us to start looking at big, big artifacts and things like that. The other thing that we can do with Raman, and this is actually not a heritage sample at all, um, this is a, one of my chemistry samples, my materials side of my research. But some of the big Raman in the lab, they have the ability to map, which means that we can look at spectra at different points and we can actually get a picture of a wider range rather than a point, space in, point in space. So we can start to correlate this with things like our SEM images. So what we can see here, this is just... Um, a, a, a ceramic material that we've made, but you can see that we have different Raman spectra based on the color. So the different color on this map tells us the different types of spectra and actually gives us information. There's about seven and a half thousand spectra in this map. So you can see we can collect a lot of data and it can give us a lot of information. Um, in a talk, Ellie mentioned um, diamond light source and I wanted to just mention central facilities. We're starting to use central facilities more. So central facilities are where we can do bigger scale experiments and we are awarded time to go access these facilities. So they have a lot of specialist equipment that runs on, so we use the neutrons and the synchrotrons. And this is some other work that I just wanted to point out. Unfortunately, some of it's not mine. Um, diamond was used, so this is a, a Herculean scroll and they use diamond light source to have a look, to try and read the text. The scroll is obviously very, very old and very delicate. So they use diamond light source to image and to try and read the text that's in the scroll without actually unwinding it. So they could start to get information. Um, this, is, this was taken from the diamond website. Um, this one here is a Egyptian, uh, Egyptian jug, dips and bars and this was imaged using neutrons and you can start to see it's a sealed jar and you can start to see what's going on inside of it so we can start to get information on a big scale um, we've been using uh diamonds x-ray facilities so there are much better x-ray facilities and lab lots more power because of the way that it's done and we can see here this is this is some data on the right hand side that we collected from the bricks so you can see we've got a lot a lot more information here. And if you look at uh, the figure on the left, this is a comparison between the lab based equipment and diamond, which is number two, number one, sorry. And you can see, we can see a lot more information. So we can also use central facilities to start to design bespoke experiments so that we can really understand the heritage materials that we're looking at. Um, so just wanted to summarize. No. We can provide a lot of science doesn't tend to appear in the blurb when we're at a museum. We see the hair, we see where it's from, we see um, you know its history, but we don't see the bits that go beyond this behind the scenes to understand it. And there's a lot of work that goes on to try and understand and understand key information about the chemistry and the structure of the artifact itself, but also any materials that are foreign to the artifact that might be starting to. Um, degrade the artifact. Sorry, I just noticed a spelling mistake uh, on that slide. Um, and this understanding is really important if we're going to think about how we protect these materials, but also understand what's happening when we do these treatments to protect them. What's the outcome of that? And how do we start thinking about that? And obviously, the more we do these things, starting to think about how do we perhaps get some of these laboratory techniques in situ. And there's a lot of work kind of, you know, Raman spectroscopy was on the Mars rover, for example. So, you know, if we can get it in space, we can get it underwater to look at in situ things. Um, some thank you, I should say some thank yous too. Um, I'm internally grateful to Ellie for, and the Mary Rose Trust for bringing me into this really exciting project and work that we're doing and thinking about my science in different ways. Um, Rebecca and Kevin were some people who helped collect the XRD and, and Rebecca worked with Ellie at the Mary Rose. Um, and I thank you for listening. Thank you, Donna. I think this is absolutely fascinating. I mean, they are 
lots of things I probably didn't understand. <laughs> so I'm really not a scientist, but I think what again you you um, underline and you explain very well is all the information that we can get from objects that at first sight might seem valueless, like a brick. I mean, a brick in itself would have not no doesn't have any value on the art market, for example. It is not valuable for treasure hunters. This is something that would likely to be destroyed during an illicit excavation, an illicit underwater excavation. And nevertheless, they are essential for us to know more about, uh, to know more about the past, but also to know more about how to preserve for the future. And, and that is absolutely fascinating. Um, so what we're going to now to um, have our third speaker, um, Fiona Punter, who we talked about uh, shipwrecks in museums, in labs, but now we're going to talk about shipwrecks and underwater heritage and conservation more generally, because we should not forget that when we talk about underwater heritage, we obviously talk about the sea, uh, we talk about the environment, and that, that those, those things are in closely interlinked. Um, and there are approximately, I, I read in an article that there were approximately 10,000 shipwrecks um, in UK waters. So it's all around, obviously, the, the UK. It's, it's a large area of water. There are many, many that are in the channel uh, because, because, because it's, it's, a, it's an island. <laughs> The UK is an island. So there are obviously lots of shipwrecks um, in the channel, which is a very busy um, area of, of, um, of transit. Um, and so many of them are found in the channel and some of them are in the Goodwin Sands. And Fiona is now going to tell us about the work that she does with a trust in order to preserve those um, shipwrecks. But before she does that, let me introduce her. Um, she has had a, a long career in media sales and business development um, in women's magazines, commercial, radio, television. And uh, she also was a conference director for the military and security sectors. And now we are so lucky that she decided to take a rest and concentrate on protecting the Goodwood Sons in deal. So Fiona, the floor is yours. Good evening, everybody. Let's just, um, Fiona is also extremely technically challenged. Let's have a go. Right. Absolutely nothing there. <laughs> um, oh dear. Um, Sophie. Can you share? Okay. Can you do, could you run yep. it? Because uh, I have, I have bandwidth if, um, issues, everybody. Sorry about this. Um, and despite putting the share screen, ah, that's it, that's fantastic. Okay, let's go with the first slide on. Lovely, that's great. So yeah, as I said, I am technically challenged, but I do have major bandwidth issues. Apologies for that. Um, this is just a top line presentation. Um, it does actually leave out far more than it includes because of time. But I thought we'd all like to see this lovely photograph of the Goodwin Sands to start with. And we'll go with the next slide, please, Sophie. Thank you. Right, um, in a nutshell, our charitable trust was founded just two years ago. There are five of us involved and we're based in Deal. The trust is a sister organization to our campaigning arm, Goodwin Sands SOS, which was created in 2016 in response to Dover Harbour Board's plans to dredge 3 million tonnes of sand from Goodwins to use as landfill for the Dover Western Docks Redevelopment Scheme. The SOS campaign is still ongoing uh, and it illustrated that there is a huge affection for the Goodwins locally, nationally and internationally. But uh, a deeper knowledge and understanding of their pivotal role in our maritime and cultural heritage has in fact faded as local communities change, as they evolve from generations who were once intimately involved with the sea. We believe that the sands are as iconic as the White Cliffs of Dover and should be treated with the same respect. So decided that one of the main focuses of the trust was to reawaken public awareness and knowledge about the sands with a mission to re-engage and re-establish understanding of the Goodwins within the collective consciousness. 
A key role of the trust will be to increase social awareness and to secure the unique sounds for the benefit of future generations. Just what Donna was talking about a few minutes ago. Next slide, please. So you might well ask, where are the Goodwins? Um, they lie about four to five kilometers off the East Kent coast. The two sandbanks combined, there we go, you can see them there. The two sandbanks combined are about 16 kilometers long. A large expanse of the top of the sandbanks are exposed for about an hour twice daily at low tide. The only time you can visit them on foot from a boat. The Goodwins technically are dynamic by nature. This means that they are constantly moving, swirling and shifting in a closed system. So wrecks exposed at one tide can easily be covered by one metre or more of sand by the next. Next slide, please. Situated in the busiest shipping lane in the world, the Goodwins have posed a hazard to navigation for centuries. The ship swallower, as it used to be called, is a graveyard to over 2,000 ships. The earliest record of a wreck was in 1298, but wrecks from before the Roman period most likely lie here, as has been evidenced by Bronze Age finds at, from France at Langdon Bay near Dover. The Great Storm of 1703 uh, claimed the lives of about 1,200 sailors, along with 130 vessels that had been sheltering in the Downs, a safe anchorage in the sands. Four Royal Navy warships, the Mary, the Northumberland, the Restoration and the Stirling Castle lie here. They all have protected wreck status, along with the Roosevelt and Admiral Gardner, both East Indiamen that founded there nearly 300 years ago. During World War II, the presence of several military airfields in East Kent made it highly likely that both Allied and Axis planes were lost in the Goodwins during this conflict. Research by the Kent Battle of Britain Museum at Hawkinge has revealed that the remains of B-17s, Dorniers, like the one pictured, which was recovered in 2013, as well as hurricanes, Messerschmitts and Spitfires all lie here along with their crews. This now famous photograph of pilot officer Keith Gilman featured on the cover of Picture Post magazine, which was published a week after his death in 1940. He was aged just 19 and his remains on the Goodwins were never found. Going back to World War I, the known wrecks of three German submarines and their crews lie here. And we mustn't forget the many merchant vessels like the Tug Char, which was run down in 1915 with all hands lost. One of the most important commands of World War I, the Royal Navy's discreet Dover Patrol Force, that's well known for the famous Siebrugger raid, has ships and men lost in the Goodwins. Slightly left of centre for heritage, but still important. The sands also provide a much needed natural sea defence um, for the locally threatened East Kent foreshore. Um, it protect, they protect villages like Kingsdown from rising sea levels. They're also special because they were designated a marine conservation zone, commonly known as an NCZ, um, in 2019. Uh, this forms part of uh, the blue belt chain of such sites ostensibly protecting marine life around our island shores. Next slide, please. The Goodwins are important as well because they form a key part of our cultural and leisure activities. Artists like Turner and Cook painted them, hovercrafts used to visit, and many a cricket match has been played here. The most infamous one was in 2006 when a BBC crew filming a match outstayed their welcome and had to be rescued by the RNLI. Typical reporters, they wouldn't listen. Today, regular day trips land by boat from both Dover and Ramsgate. Or if you're made of strong stuff, you can always paddle your own kayak. 
How this Victorian lady actually cycled on the sands is beyond me. She must have had superhuman sized thighs. Next slide, please. So, how do we plan on engaging with the community to ensure the sands are understood and valued in the modern day? Well, in common with many other organisations, much of our community focused activity this year has had to be postponed due to the pandemic. Uh, other plans are still in gestation. Some of these are actually really quite exciting and we really can't wait to, to announce them, but you have to wait and watch for those on our website. In the short term, our, fo our focus is behind the creation of our educational platform. We're developing a programme of talks aimed at schools, starting with younger age groups. This has been undertaken with a small group of local educators uh, with hands on displays, complete with the sand, water, and the occasional cannonball. Our evolving website, designed by a local supporter, is developing really a developing work in progress. Ultimately, it will be engineered to become the ultimate resource centre of the books, art and literature, of, um, amateur and professional artists and photographers. We will also be creating a competition for school children. I, my internet looks like it's about to kick over. Um, we will be creating a competition for school children across a wide range of ages to design greeting cards judged by a panel of local artists. The prize, of course, no guesses here, will be a trip to see the sands. In 2019, an intrepid group of experienced distance swimmers uh, swam a relay from Ramsgate to Guillaume via the Goodwins. And in 2021, they will see a different watery challenge linking to the Goodwins. I say rather them than me. And of course, there is always fundraising, which will feature at the local shows where we will be taking our nice new exhibition stand, which is yet to get an outing. Next slide, please. To date, we published a lovely leaflet, which was designed with the help of supporters, um, but due to COVID, we haven't uh, really been able to distribute it to many museums, shops, and relevant places of interest in East Kent, but I'll have to wait till next year. And very soon, our much anticipated, well, it has been with the Trust, much anticipated historic in one of those, will be unveiled on Warmer Green. This has been funded by our own efforts along with contributions from the Roger DeHaan Trust and Deal, Warmer and Dover Councils. Our Facebook and web communities continue to grow and we've even produced a tote bag designed by another local from Deal. The last slide, please. I will leave you with a quote from Shakespeare's Merchant of Venice and this dramatic picture of the South Goodwin's lightship wrecked by a storm in 1954. Its crew were never recovered and the only survivor was an official bird watcher. Thank you for listening to me and for the opportunity to speak today. Thank you so much uh, for this very interesting presentation. So I do now have a message to our participants. You, you can ask questions if you want to to the chat function. So if you go down, if you browse your your um, arrow down the, the, the page, you have the, the chat that will appear on the right hand side and you can send your questions and we will be asking them to our um, panelists. Um, before we get our first question, I think I have one. I'm going to take uh, my privilege as a share of this panel. Um, you mentioned actually the, the, the three of you, Bermini, Ailey and, and Fiona, that uh, those shipwrecks of UCL were also carrying people. And when they sunk, they usually had some victims and people dying with them. So 
what what happens or what has happened to those human remains? Uh, you mentioned earlier, I think that there were 500 people on board. Uh, you found the skeleton of a dog, which you showed us. But what about human remains? Um, how are, are they being preserved in the museum or have they been put somewhere else or? OK, so we yeah, we, we do have um, human remains. They are all kept in their own separate room in separate boxes. Um, and they, we, we do actually have one full um, human remain on display in the museum, but that was very carefully thought out. We actually put together a, a committee, a curatorial committee to discuss that, decide whether it was appropriate, if it was, how best to do that. So a, a lot of thought was put into it. And our, our entire museum is dedicated to the people that went down with the ship and tragically lost their lives. We also, we have a ceremony, well, it didn't happen this year for obvious reasons, but we have a, um, usually we have a ceremony every year. So one of the um, false fleet remains was buried at Portsmouth Cathedral. And we have a ceremony there every year in remembrance of them. Um, and we have some other human remains on display where it's to, to try to tell some of their story. As I say, that the whole museum is dedicated to them and to try and, try and tell their story. Sometimes it can be, um, about particular things they will have been through, or um, sometimes we're able to tell diseases, or for example, you can tell from some of the human remains who the archers were. So we have um, some of them on display and all the rest of them very carefully looked after in a slightly different way to, to the rest of the, the collection. Thank you. Um, Fiona, you did mention in the, on a different topic that um, you, the, the trust is very active in protecting uh, the Sandwind Trust, but what kind of threats exactly are there? So you mentioned the uh, dredging, you mentioned what, are there other threats that have um, happened? Because that is probably also relevant for all of Kent and other um, coastal areas. The, we don't see in, inshore fishing threat these days because the, the traditional dredging that everyone thinks about with fishing isn't undertaken by the tiny inshore fleet fleets in this area. Um, so the fishing is not a major issue at all uh, on inshore. The real threat is dredging. Um, the, it, it is a vital natural sea defence. The good winds are a closed system, which means what you take is not replaced. Um, these are not our figures. This is, comes from renowned um, experts. So once it's gone, it's gone forever. And you also have a cumulative effect of dredging. So it's not just the history. Oops, I'm afraid. I'm afraid culture, just... which in future generations people might have used on. Sorry. Sorry, you were gone. It just the internet went off. No, I, I'm sorry. I, I have buffering issues. Um, one day I'll get an Ethernet. Um, so you, it, future technology like LIDAR is used on land, one day might be able to show what really lies in the good winds. Um, and we don't want it to be destroyed before it's discovered. Um, we don't want it sucked up into a dredge head, but that's very much the SOS campaign's focus. We've had to differentiate the two organisations. Not least, there is the issue as well, of, I don't know how much was caught because of the buffering, but it's the threat to the foreshore as well. So you've got environmental issues, you've got ecological um, issues, and you've got cultural and historic real heritage issues too. Thank you. Um, so we do you have i think we've got very interesting questions of preservation and safeguarding here sorry to cut you off um so we do have another question to uh mainly eleanor um so saskia's question from to eleanor and um donna in particular uh can you please give example as to where conservations conservation straight strategy has changed on the basis of your research yes I would more say, though, actually, there's lots of situations where without the science and engineering research, the conservation strategy wouldn't have been able to be developed in the first place. <laughs> because if you think about the, the understanding of the word, even, you know, looking at the structure of it, all that research is, is building it together. And so you can then develop a strategy. But, but certainly now, yeah, some of the work we do on the iron cannonballs, that's 
we we've done different conservation treatments to them and that and now we're using various different techniques to look at and see how they've fared over time so we can compare them and think right well which is which is the better one are they all not that good is there a new technology now which would change it that's that's the other important thing this constantly changes so what might have been a good conservation treatment 30 years ago there might be it, it probably was the best thing then but there might be something better now so it's constantly changing um and it never ends um and and it's certainly the the work that we that I'm doing with Donna on the bricks from the galley, they, the bricks were originally just put through a cascade wash, which was absolutely the right thing to do. But at that particular time, there was no knowledge of things like sulfur and iron that could be in the bricks. And now that we do know that, we can obviously use that information on our collection and, and know what's there, so that can help inform how we conserve things. But equally, it's also really important that if then there was another shipwreck that they were excavating, we'd say to them, hey, you need to be careful about that. You might not be able to see it now, it might not be a problem now, but in 10, 20, 30 years time, it, it might be a problem. Thank you. Donna, do you want to add anything? Yeah, I mean, I would just add also that the the technological advances that happen with the analysis instrumentation and especially places like central facilities mean that actually experiments that were just not accessible 30 years ago are now, but even experiments that weren't accessible five years ago are becoming accessible now. Diamond has a great program for doing, for example, long duration experiments, which means that you can actually in real time, you collect rather than collecting your data in the lab and having to then go back. These sit in the, the situation that you want them to sit in and they're sampled every week. And you can build up this picture over, over time. So you can start to, people are doing things like corrosion studies in, you know, in, in materials. Um, people look at battery cycling, for example. So these, these experiments have been really only accessible over the last few years. And as we dream up more and more things that we want to do, then we can actually get these, these abilities to be able to do things. You know, the, we can start to influence how these analysis techniques are designed. Thank you. Um, so we do have uh, some questions are coming. Um, wonderful, so Saskia said thank you. Um, we have a question from David about um, how can you make these underwater sites and locations more accessible through digital platforms such as AR and VR? Or is that the plan to make them more accessible? Do you have any? I mean, I think we, yes, <laughs> but you definitely could do it. Um, I think it would be brilliant to do. I've actually, there's a, there's a, a medieval ship, the Newport ship um, in Newport, and they, um, they, they, with collaborators, have built up um, um, VR of, of being on the ship. So you put the headset on and it's like you're walking around the ship and it's just amazing. That, and that's like as the ship is now, or actually as the ship would have been. But yeah, for, for sure you could do that. It's certainly something um, that we've started to talk about and look into um, because this is obviously, you know, what, what people want, what people enjoy. Um, and it's a way that you can, you know, bring things to life for people that, that aren't, aren't accessible for, for whatever reason. So I think we'll start to see a lot more of that, especially as the, the technology behind it becomes um, a little bit more mainstream and as soon as it starts to do that obviously the price will come down a bit make it a bit more accessible for people in heritage to work with <laughs> yeah i'm sure we have colleagues at kent who could work on that they've redone this in st augustine Abbey in canterbury for example so i'm sure they oh, it's definitely possible. Would be, yeah yeah would be a really interesting challenge for them we have to talk to them. Um, so we do have another questions. I think some of the panelists thanks, thanks said about, um, sorry, uh, that the science isn't very often visible when we talk about heritage. You know, we talk about archaeologists, we talk about museums, but sometimes we do not see all the work that is being done. So it's, it's, it's fantastic to have um, scientists and to understand how essential you, your work is for knowing about the past, but also knowing what's important for the future. So we do have um, a few more questions. Do you want to say, I suppose Catherine is asking about if we have any more plan or Donna, do you have any more plans to make the science more visible to the public? How can we um, engage more with the public? Yeah, I mean, uh, obviously Ellie, Ellie does a lot of this, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but I, I mean, I, I, I guess I have 
ambitions that I'd like to see um, the science become more part of collections display and information, you know, that whether that be through a QR code that you can scan with your phone if you're interested in knowing how, how was this tested and proved to be real or how was this preserved? How, how have we treated this? What's the ongoing science behind this? I, I have been developing a really big interest in, you know, moving because it, it, it you know, even, even if you've got art in a museum, there are restorations that is done to that and there are work that's done to keep them preserved, etc. But we don't often communicate. We might say we keep it in a, a dry environment, but we don't often communicate why we keep it in a dry environment. And actually, you know, communicating that science, we tend to think of science in very general, you know, you'll become a chemist um, or a physicist, but we don't often push that actually this is in our everyday lives. And this is a real opportunity to try and get science to children more and more children interested in science. We take them to museums and we teach them the history. We have an opportunity there to teach them the science too. And, and I, I think that would be really interesting. Yeah, so I, I'm, I pro probably unsurprisingly, this is something I feel quite passionately about um, and spend a, a lot of time and effort trying to, and I have to say probably one of the more, enjoy, more enjoyable parts of my job, being able to um, go out, we go to like big exhibitions like New Scientist Live, we do British Science Week where we bring um, microscopes, things like that into the museum and I'll be there for a few days so we can talk to people about what we're doing. I try and tweet a lot about what I'm doing. Um, but yeah, the one thing that I do love is when people come up and they're kind of a bit like, what science got to do with that? And I'm like, well, <laughs> let me tell you. Um, and it's a brilliant hook sometimes as well for people who maybe think science isn't for them. You know, they have this conception of it. How Donna was saying, they'll think about somebody in a lab coat, you know, with a test tube. And it's just like, no, it's so much more than that. Um, and this is such a wonderful way to, to get people interested who maybe normally would have the kind of, um, shut us down when it comes to science and engineering and you can kind of make them see how how critical it is because it is it is just as critical as all the all these other disciplines involved in in heritage indeed thank you and i think just information that this probably would be very interesting to our um to the audience is that from paul from paul who mentions that he, Historic England has virtual dive trails for many of the protected wrecks on the HE website. So if you want to dive virtually, visit Historic England website. I'm sure that's going to be a, I should probably take my kids down there. I'm sure they will love that. Um, thank you. So I think we're coming to the end of our um, talk. And I just want to thank again our three speakers for taking the time and just sharing their enthusiasm about the protection of underwater heritage. Uh, I have learned a lot and I hope that the participants have learned a lot as well. And we're going to have a next webinar of the Center for Heritage next term. So I'm looking forward to seeing you again later. Thank you.